Recording in progress. <laughs> Yes. I don't know how to get them all. I know. I don't have this a gavel. This is your guys now. This is your guys now. I'll walk it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good morning. I'd love to call the meeting to order. It's 10.02 and we have a tight agenda today. We're going to follow that agenda, aren't we, Mayor Russell? Um, let's begin by uh, doing our Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And then, Sally, do you want to do, do we stand for your reading? or? Um, we can sit down um, and take a moment for our land acknowledgement. We would like to thank the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs for offering this land acknowledgement for us to read during our meetings. We encourage everyone watching to learn more about indigenous people whose homelands we occupy. We would like to acknowledge that the beautiful land known as Bend, Oregon, north to the Columbia River is the original homeland of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. The Confederated Tribes ceded this land in the Treaty of 1855 while retaining regular and customary hunting, fishing, and gathering rights. The Wanalama, Warm Springs, Wasco, Wasco, and Northern Paiute people inhabited this area in certain seasonal times that clearly established their presence. It's also important to note that the Klamath Trail ran north through this region to the Great Celilo Falls trading grounds. This trade route expanded the impact of commerce between tribal nations. We acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this land. It is our hope that guests continue to honor and care for this land. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sally. Um, it is amazing. It is the largest reservation in our state. And um, I always think about it um, when I drive through because I'm a horse person, and you will see their horses having babies like in January or February, which the thoroughbred industry would do anything to figure out how the, that happens. But that happens in nature when you drive through the Warm Springs. So I always, um, um, it's a beautiful piece of property. So we have our agenda in front of you. It's, um, I'm so glad we are here today. I um, want to welcome every one of you. We have some really important work that we're doing. I, am, I know that they're doing the homeless, the count right at this moment. And honestly, last summer, Colleen, Thomas, and I, we independently came up with 1,500 people homeless in Deschutes County. Um, uh, it will be interesting to see because we haven't really had a blizzard this week. So when they're doing the count, hopefully our count is going to be fairly accurate accurate the people that are trusting of those taking that information I know some years people don't want to be counted and we know that the people out making the count are people that have relationships it's it's so important for vulnerable people to trust and know that we need to do something differently um, I was watching someone in LA the other day on the national news and what they said they were doing in Los Angeles is okay they move them off Venice Beach but they just move them somewhere else. They never get to the root of the problem. And truly, I'm hoping that our group can get to the root of the problem. I feel like that is really what it's all about. So um, thank you. Sally, did you want to have any opening remarks? Um, I will just say I'm very much looking forward to um, learning more about the structure that we in our broader community can could put in place to move through this really difficult challenge in front of our communities. And the more we can find to f in the myth and identify in processes and partnerships to move forward and make sure that everyone in our community who is in our community has a place to live and can work and thrive is so important. So I, as I was previewing this packet, as I'm sure all of you have today, and certainly it's available on the Deschutes County website and through the City of Bend website, um, everyone has access to this information 
and can learn more about it with us as we move through this meeting today and if they want to go back and and begin to really understand the level of work that is happening in our community today is really talking about opportunities and partnerships so i'm really thrilled to be here the other thing i want to acknowledge quickly is that we have all seven seven members of our city council today i want to acknowledge that councillor keebler is also here and joining us virtually um, and so we are i believe the entire county commission and the entire bend city council is present at this meeting and councillor keebler um, i'm looking at you up there i think your camera's off at the second but um anyway we look forward to communicating with you and i will actually i want to just say sometimes it's a little awkward when we're working with people who are virtual so i want to be sure that everybody sort of keeps an on councillor keebler and Councillor Keebler, you can both raise your hand and you can also text me when you have comments and, and you want to contribute to this conversation. So thank you for <clears throat> making the extra effort um, as well as staff who made it possible today. So with that, um, let's move into item number one. So I can kick off this first item uh, and provide a bit of an introduction. So what you're about to see is a visual narrative that was created by members of the Emergency Homelessness Task Force, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. Um, it was really a process that uh, was, that's been in place for about eight months. And the, the narrative really offers an opportunity to increase awareness about the proposed strategic plan that the task force uh, developed. And it really is centering us around the experts doing the work. We're wanting to hear from those that are at the, at the ground level so that as we put together our plan, it's being informed by, by those experts. So just a big thank you to the task force members that included Bethlehem Inn, our City of Bend staff, uh, including the police department, the Deschutes County staff, especially behavioral health and public health, uh, Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council, Central Oregon Veterans Outreach, uh, Deschutes County Sheriff's Office, uh, FUSE, which is the Central Oregon Frequent Users System Engagement Group, Homeless Leadership Coalition, Housing Works, J Bar J Youth Services, Jericho Road and Redmond Oasis Village Project, Neighbor Impact, Shepherd's House, St. Charles, Mosaic, Pacific Source, REACH, which stands for Relationship Empowerment, Action Compassionate Heart, The Helpers, and then of course our Emergency Homelessness Task Force partners that were also part of reviewing this plan that included our business partners at the Chamber, uh, Visit Bend, EDCO, uh, school districts, uh, the chair, and then the homeless liaisons through the Ben Lapine School District, and many more experts like the Family Kitchen, et cetera. We're really grateful uh, for all their wisdom and the time that they've given to help us to this point. So I'm going to turn it over to Don Boone. Uh, Don will be giving a tour of the visual narrative, and then Brittany Manzo will be followed by that, uh, by Don's presentation, and will give an overview of the strategic plan. Just a little background about Dawn. She has lived in Bend for more than 20 years. She's a graphic designer, copywriter, and visual storyteller. And she's partnered with Zoe Media, Zoe Agency, to bring the visual narrative project to life. So I'm going to turn it over to Dawn to kind of walk you through, I believe. We've got it kind of queued up on the screen so folks, uh, both virtually and in person, can, can see it. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, this narrative is, is the result of the work done through the task force can i stop can i do a sound check yes we're going to share it yeah so can i be get queued up thank you because i can't you can yeah. scoot the that mic a little closer too yeah <clears throat> thank you Last week, we had a very challenging week with our sound. So <laughs> this week, it's gone a little smoother. I want to be sure we have just a really clean, good recording for people yes. to be able to, to see and hear. Is the sound quality good now? Bring, bring the mic even closer. It's not yeah. close enough. Hard to get it close yeah. with the mouse in that area. You could also put it on the other side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me do this. Okay. How's this? Better? Okay. Perfect. Okay. Sneaky. <laughs> 
So this narrative comes from the people at the epicenter of our crisis of houselessness. Uh, it tells stories of families who are houseless and hanging on to hope. And it also tells the broader story of what our crisis uh, looks like, what houselessness looks like in our community, and how it has such a profound impact on the people who are experiencing it. And this narrative also shares uh, many of the inspiring ways our community is rising up to meet the moment. When the task force convened last summer, it reached out to housing experts and scores of organizations serving the houseless. And from all those discussions, one thing became apparent, that we, the public, need to know what they know. Because our view is a very limited view. Much, um, many of the forces of houselessness are invisible to us as well as the experiences of the houseless. So, uh, and, and in that context, it's uh, damaging misconceptions have kind of circulated in our community. So this narrative, part of its purpose is to address those misconceptions and give us a clearer view. Uh, working on this project was a self-education <laughs> for me. Uh, I, I had myself struggled with conflicting feelings about houselessness. And uh, thanks to all the conversations I had with providers in our area, um, I gained a great deal of clarity. And I hope that clarity is something that uh, anyone who spends time with this narrative um, will also enjoy. The narrative is called Addressing Houselessness in Deschutes County. You can find it online at houselessindeschutes.org. We open with a, an image of Veterans Village, which is a wonderful example of what's possible when we work together. Before we dive into some of the darker aspects of this crisis, it is important to note that there are many bright spots. Right now, we are making incredible headway. Um, there are more shelters and affordable housing units coming online. The city of Bend is converting motels for additional shelters. Deschutes County has just approved several million dollars to support affordable housing projects throughout the county. We do have a long ways to go, <clears throat> but we are making progress. Um, the narrative here is offers up lots of visuals and quotes from people, again, at the center of this crisis, as well as some interviews with uh, individuals who are homeless. I'm going to stick with the main thread of the narrative to start, and I will circle back to some of those other points in a bit. An overarching view of houselessness in our community, um, from the point in time count from last January, we identified 992 people that were houseless. And at the start of this school year, Sisters, Redmond, and Ben Lapine School Districts identified 423 students that are houseless. This reflects a growing trend where houselessness has been on the rise in Central Oregon. And in order to fully address this crisis, we do need to have a better view <coughs> and get a bit more creative <laughs> and pull in some collective brain power. We start with what we've learned, and this is really the bulk of the work from the task force, um, talking with dozens of providers and housing experts across the county and across the region. What drives houselessness? There is no single cause, is the short answer. There are multiple factors that often combine to tip someone into houselessness. But for our community, the primary driver is inadequate wages and costly housing. Whenever any community has those two factors in play, it is an automatic recipe for increased houselessness. Simply put, <clears throat> households get stretched too thin where their wages struggle to spread across all of their basic necessities. And when housing costs take up more than 30% of a household's earnings, they are 
at risk. Before the pandemic even hit, United Way had found <clears throat> more than 13,000 households in Deschutes County that were living on the edge. And when households are stretched that thin, a single event can often stretch their finances to the breaking point. This chart here tells uh, the story from a slightly different point of view. The yellow line represents what average house income households and can afford for a house, whereas the red line shows what the average median home price uh, in Bend currently is at as of November. There is a significant gap, which means many, many households are simply unable to afford a house. There are other causes of houselessness that are feeding into this crisis in our community. The pandemic, of course, created multiple stressors on families um, between lost wages, lost childcare. On an individual level, poor health or disability can make a person extremely vulnerable to becoming houseless, as well as a lack of family or social support. What does houselessness look like? What we've seen is not the whole picture. And that is because there are actually four different categories of houselessness. The, the type of houselessness that we tend to see in our community is what we call chronic houselessness, where people have been houseless for years. And um, of note, Central Oregon has one of the highest rates of unsheltered houseless in the nation. So our houseless are especially visible. There are, um, of course, other groups, transitional houseless, often are experiencing just a brief dip in their situation and with a short stay in an emergency shelter, they can quickly get back on their feet. Um, episodic houselessness is like frequent bouts going in and out of housing. This is very typical for youth and young adults and it's typically because they have been forced out of the home before they were ready to be fully independent. They lack work experience, they lack life skills, they lack savings and transportation. This group is at great risk of becoming chronically houseless unless there are some quick interventions. And then we have the hidden houseless. And we really do not know how many of, in this group there are. They go uncounted in the point in time count. Um, some of the uh, children that were identified by school districts as houseless are actually part of this group, but this reflects families that are doubled up under one roof. This reflects young adults who are couch surfing. Their, situ their housing situation is highly unstable because they have no long-term guarantee they can continue living where they are. So what keeps people houseless? Too many barriers, too little hope. Um, the, the idea of barriers was an eye-opener for me personally. Um, for most of us who have stable housing, stable jobs, uh, extended support systems, the things that we do day in, day out do not feel like barriers to us. But once you slip into mm -hmm. houselessness, it's akin to falling into quicksand. Everything that you have to do to try and get your stability back becomes extremely difficult. The houseless face multiple barriers to employment, um, cascading hurdles, everything from trying to um, present well in an interview when you don't have clean clothes, you don't have access to a shower, you don't have reliable transportation to get to an interview, um, your ID may have been lost or stolen, there are barriers to health care, just literally accessing health care, but also um, as Elaine Nobbs, C. Schultz at Mosaic Medical noted, one of the biggest barriers is actually a lack of trust in the healthcare system. The cumulative effect to all this is that um, the houseless do lose hope. 
they also experience a great deal of trauma because houselessness is traumatic. And living in crisis mode, they lose the capacity to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They are frequently ostracized from our community. <clears throat> and all of this conspires to keep them psychologically pulled down. So for all the people who were um, engaged in the task force and interviewed for this narrative, they were asked, what kinds of challenges do you see? What, what is holding us back from making real progress mm -hmm. on this crisis? And the task force identified 66 groups in our region who are serving the houseless or working on housing. That is an impressive amount of um, community willpower to work on this. <clears throat> and they're everything from fan advocates in the schools, informal Facebook groups, faith-based groups, nonprofits, shelters, city government. And so here are some of the challenges. One, there's no regional strategy. Um, if we take the analogy of all of our groups as an orchestra, we lack a conductor. And the, the individual groups are not really positioned or designed in such a way to provide regional strategy for everyone else. Because of that, we also have a lot of gaps and overlap. Um, the, the providers in our region have been working extremely hard. And as the crisis has intensified, their workload has intensified. But there is, again, a kind of a lack of coordination. There are definitely partnerships. They, they do partner quite frequently. But there is kind of that overarching, a lack of overarching direction. And uh, again, going back to the orchestra analogy, it's like we have a lot of violins and maybe a bass, but very few cellos or violas. <laughs> Our region is very strong with shelter and food, but lacks uh, some of the other resources that we need as a whole to, to transition someone from houselessness back into stable housing. The third challenge is there is not enough funding. Um, our, many of the entities who serve the houseless use a coordinated entry system, which is a wonderful way to interview and identify someone and determine the level of need and the level of risk and vulnerability and rank them in, in terms of resources that they should get to, to quickly transition, transition them back into housing. But after doing that exercise, there are no resources to give. Um, one provider I interviewed said it's like we're fighting over scraps. So there really needs to be uh, funding tends to also kind of peak and valley. And what, what's needed is stable funding where they can build out programs and provide resources. The fourth challenge, there is not enough affordable housing. We've already seen that from our earlier graph. <laughs> uh, that graph basically reflects in Bend, a de deficit of 5,000 homes in the right price range for a lot of our average families and households to afford a house. And right now we are, as Lynn McConnell uh, stated from the city of Bend, we're facing a math problem where the only way affordable housing can be built is through a combination of different types of funding, programs, subsidies. The market is simply is not able to allow affordable housing to be built on its own. <laughs> and the last challenge is there is not enough permanent supportive housing. I had not encountered this term before, but it's just like it sounds. For, for chronically unhoused individuals who are using services the most heavily, emergency room visits, hospital stays, requests for law enforcement, giving them permanent supportive housing, which is long-term affordable housing wrapped with support services, saves money, eases the strain on our community resources, and has been a proven model. But unfortunately, <laughs> Central Oregon 
lags behind national averages in terms of the number of supportive housing units that we are able to provide. Right now we have a need of more than 200, 200 vulnerable disabled individuals who need housing like this and we have less than 30 units. So <laughs> a solution is within reach. <laughs> Um, bringing together all of these different entities in our region, um, identifying the challenges, they have arrived at some solutions which are um, going to be in the strategic plan that Brittany shares with you in a few minutes. But before we can fully embrace solutions, we need to have a full grounding of the reality that the solutions are based in. and that. That means we also have to reckon with some of the misconceptions that have been circulating in our community. I'm gonna scroll back to the top here. <laughs> Kathy Skidmore from Central Oregon Veterans Outreach noted it's easy to draw con conclusions about the houseless based on what we see but it is more complicated and it's we're unlikely to see or understand the full impact of houselessness on those who experience it many of the providers uh, that were interviewed for this narrative um, said they frequently come up, bump up against these misconceptions when they talk with the community at large one is the houseless are just not trying hard enough. As we've already discussed in the barriers piece, um, there is a, a, a lot of barriers facing the houseless, but also many of the houseless are working. But because of the barriers they face, they're not always able to secure traditional, long-term, stable employment. <coughs> Instead, they're having to work for trade, they're having to work seasonal jobs, but they're also facing a lot of discrimination. Um, one of the stories that is featured in this narrative is of a woman named Regina who worked for two years and was hiding her living situation from her coworkers and manager. And one day they discovered that she was houseless and she was promptly fired. Other, uh, another couple that we interviewed have been looking for work, but because they cannot put down a permanent address on their application. It's just a giant red flag for an employer and they literally have not been able to be hired. Another unfortunate misconception is uh, people in our community believing that the houseless simply aren't from here. The point in time count added a survey last year to determine where these houseless individuals were from. And an overwhelming majority are from this area, have been in Central Oregon for more than three years. And before becoming houseless, 84% said their last stable housing had been in Oregon. Mm. Lastly, the misconception that the houseless are not our responsibility. Houselessness does not occur in a vacuum of personal failure. As we noted, houselessness only plagues communities where there is low wages and skyrocketing housing prices. And both those elements can be controlled through public policy. We are living in a landscape where past decisions about policy at the local, state, and national level have created this current storm, <laughs> this perfect storm for houselessness here. So <clears throat> we can take responsibility for changing the landscape and giving everyone a fighting chance at stable housing, affordable housing. But also our community is starting to recognize that this is reaching the scale of a local humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. These are people that we are talking about and especially when you consider the more than 400 children who are at risk of having lifelong impacts from this experience, 
it requires our community to step up and do something. I'm going to quickly share <coughs> a look at a couple stories here. John and Tess, who, uh, these, well, let me back up for just one second. We included these stories because every story is different, but all of the stories we gathered defied typical stereotypes that people hold about the houseless. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, John and Tess are actually homeowners, but they were forced to leave their house because of an infrastructure failing. Their septic system failed. Their property was no longer safe to live in. They had to move into the forest with their four children and have been struggling to come up with funds to make that expensive repair. Um, <clears throat> they've experienced a lot of the typical um, unfortunate scenarios that the houseless face. Their first camper burned down. They lost their children's birth certificates. That is a, a very common struggle with the houseless their, their property is either damaged or lost or stolen. John had also been employed for more than 20 years, but had recently lost his job. So with the family living paycheck to paycheck, having that one episode of the septic system failing was enough to tip them into houselessness. We also have a story of Sierra, who's finishing up her last semester in high school, who was forced out of the home um, and, live, and had experienced a very difficult home environment filled with domestic abuse or domestic violence, sexual abuse, and um, was lucky to find transitional housing with the loft run by J Bar J. And she does have a housing voucher, but the wait list is several months long. She is keenly aware of um, what's at stake if she loses her, her current housing situation. And um, it is a bit heartbreaking for the youth who, um, as Eliza Wilson of J Bar J said, none of the young people ever choose to be homeless. They are either forced out of the home, often for sexual identity, or they are leaving out of sheer self-preservation. That said, it's very telling that everyone we interviewed from the providers to the people who are experiencing houselessness, they all still have hope. And that should make us hopeful as well, that uh, they do believe there is a way forward, and it just requires all of us coming together as a community. That's the end of my tour. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions or comments, I'm, I'm uh, happy to hear them. Otherwise, I'll pass it on to Brittany. I did have a question when I was reading it last night. Um, you don't, um, on the page with the different reasons why people go homeless, the causes of houselessness, you don't have substance abuse there. And then what about mental illness? Um, I don't, it's, you know, it's not there. And I know our healthcare system, you know, closed the state, um, mental, you know, the state hospitals, you know, unfortunately, you know, Pendleton, the state hospital there was closed in 2014. You know, at one point in time, Oregon had 500, no, 5,500 people in mental hospitals. Maybe we were at like the high end, but you know, where are the people that were in Pendleton at the very end? Where are they today? I, I mean, I just think, um, there's truly, we just, as Eric's wife saw, there was a naked woman on the street in downtown Bend the other day. Clearly, she needed help. You know, there's only 16 beds in, um, you know, the lockdown facility by OSP, and then we have Sageview, and we have St. Charles, but clearly there, there is mental health out there. You know, I'm just wondering why that wasn't listed. So, do you want... Hmm? So, um, in speaking with Colleen Thomas at Deschutes County Behavioral Health, 
um, they, their teams are serving um, a large percentage of the houseless in our area, and only 30% of their client, 30% uh, of the houseless in our area are requiring um, mental health services. There, there is though an, an issue of mental health. Um, one of the stories we included in our narrative of Regina, um, her houselessness was initially triggered by her uh, addiction issues, her substance abuse issues, and she was a young woman. But tellingly, she has been trying for many years since to improve her situation, but once she became houseless and chronically houseless, it's been extremely difficult for her to get back out. And her two daughters have lived most of their childhood houseless with her. And I just would like to note that, I mean, health issues and disability are listed as causes. And so I think, you know, you could obviously include mental health with, within that, um, you know, that category. Um, and also there are, there are plenty of people experiencing addiction, struggling with addiction or mental health um, issues who are, are housed. So I think that, you know, really focusing in on the, the housing cost and wage was very uh, enlightening for me in this report of really focusing in on what are those root causes in our community. Hey, Colleen Tal Thomas is available if we would like for her to respond to any questions as well. Uh, I think Councillor Perkins had a question. Be great. It's not a question. It's a gush. Um, I just want to say thank you, Don, so much for putting this together, and thank you, Mickey, and um, to all the people on the task force that contributed to this incredible resource for our community. Um, I think it's going to be a really, really valuable um, thing that we look back on in the future, and 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 that is really going to change sort of how we view houselessness. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> So is Colleen available to make a comment then? Sure, Colleen? I could, if I could also speak to this, um, I, I think Commissioner Adair is expressing a concern that on just this list of headings that there, there's not a mention of, you know, mental or behavioral health issues. And um, I, I do think that in the narrative, you know, following that, you know, this kind of list of headings, it, it is a, a well-covered topic. but. It, it could be useful, you know, uh, to add that just to, you know, contributing factors, you know, be behavioral and mental health issues. Um, just yeah, to I do explicitly have lay that out. I'm happy to add it um, later on. I do, I do recall watching the commissioners um, meeting one time where Colleen was in front of you and presenting the data with regards to how many of the houseless population here in Central Oregon are registered with behavioral health. And of those, I believe it was like, I think Commissioner Adair, you and Colleen were estimating there was like 1,500 this summer. We were last yeah. summer. And then she was saying something about like maybe 1,000 are registered um, with behavioral health. And of those 1,000, 30% are um, substance abuse um, homeless community members. So I could definitely add that as well, for sure. Okay. Well, I would just, uh, because um, you know, I knew so many people that they reached 19 and then they had a psychotic break. It, and or maybe you know maybe they had a psychotic break at 39. But I do believe it's a serious problem. I know people that are mentally are living with their family, but their family feels that um, you know how can they make sure that 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 person is still taking their meds and they're they're functioning and it just adds so much to our um, you know family situations. So I, you know, I just think it's important to um, bring it in there. And thank you, Commissioner Chang, for it. Thank you. Yeah. Just to add to that, though, it, it also we want to be careful in looking at the causation versus, you know, like whether that's a cause or a result of of being homeless. Because I certainly think that um, experiencing houselessness, you know, given the trauma that we've just heard about that's involved with that, um, could obviously significantly worse in mental health issues um, that may already be existing or addiction issues and some substance abuse issues. Yeah, that, that's why I would, it, you know, looking at these categories that we have, contributing factors seems like a good place, you know, because um, it could, you know, could be causal, could be an effect, mm -hmm. 
could be something that perpetuates homelessness, you know, like keeps you homeless, you know, one of the, one of the barriers that then keeps you from getting out of homelessness. Um, and, and, you know, so contributing factor seems like a good label for Sorry, that. We don't want to ignore it. Yeah. I think you also, it, I, I noticed that it was missing in the um, misperceptions um, section of the report, or at least I didn't, I, maybe it's in the narrative, but just in the headings. Um, I, that, I feel like that that is a misperception of the um, people that people have of the proportion of people experiencing houselessness who struggle with mental health or addiction. I would agree with that too. That would be a great addition to, to add to. Yeah, agree. All right. So, time yeah, goes. and so, um, so Councillor Schenkelberg, yes, and but what I'd like to do is make sure that we stay on track. We have a, a lot more work to move through. Yes. This is a really good conversation, um, and hopefully, you can absorb these con um, these comments and integrate them into suggestions into the narrative going forward. Council Schenkelberg, and then I think it probably makes sense to move on to the next agenda item, our strategic plan. Uh, I just want to thank Don. Like, I think that for a lot of council, we've been wanting something like this to come forward and to be able to partner with the county and really have such a robust report that's accessible for many people, being able to pull it up on your smartphone, your iPad, and that there, it's also an education tool that can span from with youth and to all ages and different pieces. I'm wondering, is there options for translation on the report? Um, and yeah, and Mickey kind of answered my question about that it's going to be ever evolving, which makes me excited, right? As we learn new information and as we come up with other policy and policy solutions, we can share those. And then as my final comment, and then I'll let you answer, is as a queer person, you talking about sexual orientation as a cause for youth who are experiencing houselessness is so impactful and so educational. Um, with regards to translation, that's definitely something that we all want to pursue. And I'm, um, we're looking into finding source for funding to translate it. So if anybody would like to <laughs> sponsor us, please send me an email, mdirting at bendoregon.gov. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mickey, and thanks, Don, again. Thank you. Thank Do you. we have a cost on what that would, to translate it, what we'd expect to pay? I mean, because I think it's very important. Um, it would probably be, um, this is a big um, estimate, $10,000, because it's not just translating, it's redesigning a whole website again and and then having translators and all that good stuff okay thank you, thank you. we 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 do have we do have bilingual staff at the county and i'm wondering if there might be a way to work with them to at least do the language component of what you're talking about um it, it, you know to, to 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 shave down the cost of that All right, are we ready to move on? So, seeing head lads? Okay, we are. Let's introduce uh, Brittany Manzo, who will take Don's place and provide an overview of the strategic plan. So just a little background, Brittany, uh, you might have uh, remember her from previous joint meetings. She's a policy strategist and independent consultant. Uh, she previously served at the Federal U.S. Interagency Council on Hol Homelessness and was the agency's policy advisor. Uh, in that role, she developed, uh, supported the development of HOME together, which are federal, part of the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness. Brittany has also served as the director of public policy at the National Innovation Service, supporting states and communities around the country in dismantling harmful systems and going toward equity. So the past months, six months, really I think it would now have been eight months, uh, Brittany has been supporting the Emergency Homelessness Task Force and developing the strategic plan in front of you. Welcome, Brittany. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I'm so glad to be with you all in person today. Um, I'm here to offer, as Eric said, an overview of the strategic plan um, and get your feedback. It is a working draft and hopefully get your green light to keep moving forward with getting more reviews, feedback, input on the strategic plan so that the collaborative office can hit the ground running. Um, so 
the strategic plan is really a roadmap forward um, from the stories that Don shared of devastating hardship and survival in the face of obstacle after obstacle. Um, a roadmap toward a future where the wealth and growth of Deschutes County is actually reflected in the well-being, the safety, and the quality of life of all of its residents. So this strategic plan is, um, is laying out what it's going to take to get us to that future. Um, in order to get there, we need to do things differently. I'm sure that's no, no surprise to folks around the table. The members of the task force, I believe it was 18 different organizations represented on the task force, outlined actions that fall into kind of five different buckets um, that are required, required work to turn the tide on the increased rates of homelessness in the community and make sure that people are able to get the supports they need in order to get back on their feet. So the, the plan, I'm also going to use this beautiful, the, the website narrative that Don shared also has a tab that outlines the plan for the, the community to see where we're hoping to head. Um, so I'll, I'll talk through our five buckets here, our five, five strategic priorities. And the first is that this is going to take the entire community, uh, the whole community's involvement. We need to enlist the community to um, to change the trends and to change the direction we're heading in. Um, it's my understanding from task force members that this narrative was developed and prioritized as a tool that they needed because of the misconceptions that members of the community have about people experiencing homelessness in Deschutes County. Um, service providers knew we're not going to get where we want to go if the level of hate against people experiencing homelessness stays at the levels that it's at or grows. Um, you know, Don shared that job applications are rejected when there's no home address listed. I think, you know, you might understand that as an employer, you worry about the stability of your employees, but it's not necessarily something you can take on in the middle of a pandemic. But how do we as community partners help employers help their employees getting back on their feet when they're struggling? Um, one of the stories Don shared is a mother of two who was fired simply because she was experiencing houselessness. People drive by encampments screaming obscenities and throwing trash. The vitriol that's come out around citing shelters to give people a roof over their heads um, has really been jarring. It's not just happening in Deschutes County, it's happening around the country, but it's going to take the entire community understanding what the realities of homelessness are understanding that their compassion needs to come to the table, understanding that there's a place for their fear to be addressed, understood, held, and worked through in community, and that there's a role for everyone to play in addressing this crisis. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing, that asking that question of what can we do rather than this is a problem, but what can we do to help out is a question that all of the partners that you all work with on a daily basis <laughs> can be asked. Um, that's employers, that's businesses, that's healthcare systems, hospitals, law enforcement, community groups, neighborhood groups, churches. A lot of folks are already involved, but building this shared understanding of how houselessness has come to be such a crisis in Deschutes County and what needs to be done in order to support people to get back on their feet is something that the task force members identified as like, we're not going anywhere until the community understands what's really happening here. Um, and I think that's a bit of, bit of what Don spoke to around the hope is that service providers know members of this community. They know they are members of this community. They know that this isn't a place that's just filled with hate and anger and resentment. The vitriol that comes at people experiencing homelessness comes from a place of fear and we know that. And building a whole of community approach to homelessness, acknowledging that our successes and our failures are shared it's going to be really necessary in moving forward. So you'll see in the actions outlined under that first strategic priority, there's a lot of public education leveraging this beautiful website and narrative. Um, there's also relationship building and partnership building. And last but certainly not least, as you all know, there are not enough resources. There's not enough funding currently available to support people experiencing homelessness. So there's a bit of fundraising in there of how do we create an intentional opportunity for public-private partnership um, for funding homeless services. So that is our first very big bucket of enlisting, enlisting the community to take on a whole of community approach. 
Um, and that's, to be honest, what every community around the country is trying to figure out how to do. How do we bring everyone along um, to, face, to face the issue and, and to support our neighbors? Um, second is a priority that you are not unfamiliar with. It's uh, coordinating our efforts and funding. This is the collaborative office, right? Um, the, uh, Don shared earlier that there's, there's no regional strategic leadership in place right now um, to guide the path forward, to show people what we're working toward and how. Service providers, um, a lot of service providers in the region were set up by grassroots community groups and their missions are evolving based on community needs, but one provider can't take it all on. Um, as hard as they try, I've been in meetings with Stacy Witte where she will get a phone call from someone who is in urgent need of support or to let her know, hey, I moved spots, I'm over here now when you come to bring water later, X, Y, Z later. And Stacy's the same person doing that delivery as she is advising the city and the county on, on what needs to be done. Um, it's just too much for, for providers to take on the strategic direction of the system to coordinate across and, and make sure that all the gaps are filled. It's, it's not, quite frankly, it's not their job. Um, when I, was, when I was working on Home Together, the, the federal strategic plan to prevent and end homelessness, we did listening sessions with people experiencing homelessness in D.C., Denver. Those were the two that I was at, D.C. and Denver. Um, we did them all over the country. But in the backyard of um, a, an advocacy organization in D.C., we set up a bunch of chairs. And, and at that time, we were really focused on homelessness prevention. So we asked folks, what would have prevented your experience of homelessness? If, if X, Y, or Z were in place, how, you know, how would that have supported you? And it was so interesting to hear that very often it was things that do exist in the community. It was supported childcare, it was transportation, but it was not set up to support them in their times of need. Um, child early Head Start and Head Start was not available in their, in their neighborhood. Transportation would have taken them far out of where they needed to head to work. It was not coordinated. And what I realized, even working at the federal government at that time, our safety net is more like bands of support. And if you fall in between those bands, you're SOL. <laughs> um, it's not a net. It's not a net that actually catches people. And so when we look at the opportunity laid out with the, uh, collaborative, with the collaborative office, it's an opportunity to make sure that transportation can connect people from a shelter to a job opportunity, from childcare to work as people strive to get back on their feet. Um, and I hope it's clear through the narrative that people are striving to get back on their feet, but our systems are failing them. So it's our system leaders that need to come together to bridge those gaps and make sure that our safety net is actually a net that catches folks. Um, and doesn't just let them fall through, fall through these gaps. Um, and I, I wanna say that this is a point that a lot of communities are coming to, that coordinated investments are where they need to go. There's a lot of great work underway, funding affordable housing from the county, behavioral health services, the city's work on standing up new shelters, but that lack of coordination is, is kind of cementing the fact that we're, we're still gonna have these bands of support and not um, a shared strategy to make sure that all of our gaps are filled. So moving on to our, our second bucket, and as we get into feedback, we can, we can review these um, as needed. Uh, expanding services. So Don lifted up that really, that really great number of 66 grassroots organizations and nonprofit providers uh, supporting people experiencing homelessness. And every single one of those, exp those organizations are strapped completely thin. Like I said, Stacy running between meetings and doing outreach. Um, Colleen Thomas wearing 17 hats, doing much of the same. John Riggs is doing garbage pickup and community support. People are, are doing the absolute best they can, sometimes not getting paid at all, sometimes getting paid the lowest wages in the community, um, unable to hire because they don't have the budgets to pay people a thriving wage. Um, people can't afford to live and work here. I think that's a, a dynamic that folks are familiar with. 
services need to be invested in in a significant way in the community. Um, we need, you need more nonprofits. You need the nonprofits you have to have the capacity to expand. Um, that's, that's something that there is federal, state, local funding opportunities for. But again, you need a, a, a shared strategy and a shared plan of what needs to be expanded. So in here we have, um, we have transportation, we have uh, stronger connections between education supports and homeless services. Um, but really this is, this is about investing in, um, you know, I, I love Don's orchestra analogy. We need percussion. We need, we need a little bit more of the brass section to come to play and that's, that's uh, all captured in the section around expanding services. And fourth is finding space for the unsheltered. Um, so we know that a, a vast majority of people experiencing homelessness in Deschutes County are living outside, um, living out in the desert. The more, uh, more marginalized they are from society, the further out they go. Um, I went to one of the Sunday kitchens uh, out in Redmond the last time I was in town and um, people were coming in from, from pretty far out to get water for the, for the week. Um, I went to, I saw one of the encampment sweeps down at the, the uh, oh, which I, down at Revere, I think. Um, and a couple had just moved in there because they had experienced racism in the encampment that they were at before that, that there was so much hate, they had to leave and find somewhere else to go. And they had landed at that encampment two days before, and that encampment was being swept, and they had to find another place not just as some of the other folks were trying to find a safe place to camp, they were trying to find a safe place where they, they wouldn't be harassed by their neighbors. Um, and so finding space where there is authorized allowance of camping, where service providers can reliably be able to meet people and, and support them with case management, support them with service connections, um, you know, on this, this photo above, um, the Mosaic Medical Clinic, I thought it was so interesting when I was in there. I said, what, what do you guys need? If you were to add to the strategic plan, what would you put in as a top priority? And they said, we need a place where we can go and we'll be sure to meet people. The fact that people have to shift around encampments um, and move around the city, they can't get reliable health care, even if they're connected to providers. Um, it, they don't know where to find them. So actually, the, the idea of an authorized encampment, from, from what I heard the folks on the ground at Mosaic Medical said 100% that's what we need, at least to start until we have enough shelter for everyone, um, storage space for everyone's belongings, and, and those kind of things to help folks get back on their feet. So in the, in the set of uh, priorities around finding space for the unsheltered, I also want to mention that there are um, some actions around supporting people to meet their basic needs. Um, there is a ton of food service. There are outreach services available, but there are not restrooms. There are not hand washing stations. There are not showers. There are not places to store people's belongings so that they can go to a job interview without losing every, without risking losing everything they own to robbery, right? Um, so, so in addition to finding authorized encampment space, we also need to make sure that there are supports in place to meet people's basic needs so that they can meet their basic needs. Um, that was something that we heard loud and clear from service providers of not only are you trying to do case management or make sure you know, that someone has a healthcare appointment, you're trying to help them find a place to go to the bathroom. You're trying to make sure that they know that the shower truck is coming by once a week to, to take care of themselves. These are the obstacles after obstacles that people are facing every day. So last, um, but certainly not least, <laughs> is affordable housing. Um, deeply affordable housing is devastatingly rare in this country, um, and it is up to local communities to decide to put what it takes on the line to finance affordable housing at zero to 30% of the average median income. Um, Affordable housing can be defined as high as 80% of the area median income. And that is wonderful that, you know, here I know we call it um, middle housing, 
But people experiencing homelessness, people working at minimum wage cannot afford even the affordable housing that's in development. It's this deeply affordable housing, subsidies, rental assistance that needs to be brought online so that people experiencing homelessness, if they're going into an entry level job or if they're experience, you know, job insecurity in the future can still afford their home. Um, I think you all know that the, the cost of living is just skyrocketed in Deschutes County, like many places in, in the Pacific Northwest, but what has not kept pace is the, the public housing at the other end of the spectrum and the prioritization of those most in need to make sure that our growth isn't leading to gentrification, segregation, or folks who've lived here for generations um, being pushed out. So there needs to be, you know, with this last bucket of work, it's about planning for deeply affordable housing. That's not the kind of thing that you can just set up in a year. It requires planning, it requires building. Um, so from the perspective of this strategic plan, it's how do we get all of our ducks in a row to be building toward a place where in 10 years, people can afford to be a barista at a local coffee shop and pay their rent in this community, right? Um, but that's gonna take work starting now. So that is the five buckets of the strategic plan. We also have some milestones that are laid out here. Um, I don't need to go through each of them, but I, I just wanna say that I found it really powerful to hear from emergency task force members that they believe these milestones are possible in this community if we put our minds to it. That in five years, no young people or elderly adults will be living outside unsheltered, that there will be shelter for all of the young people right now that are couch surfing, sleeping outside, um, in between places, as well as elderly adults who are at really high risk. Um, prevention and diversion milestones are re really important too, so that we make sure that these rates of homelessness don't just keep increasing, that when someone first starts to experience housing insecurity, we have supports in place to, to help them through. In some communities, that's done um, with close partnerships with utility providers. Um, it's actually a pretty big red flag when someone starts to fall behind on utilities. That means that they may be on their path to housing insecurity. They're making difficult choices between food, rent, utilities. Utilities is the first to go. Um, second, you know, rent eats, rent eats first, as they say. Um, so utilities are often, those partners can really help us build strong prevention systems. So I found the milestones to be really powerful because it's, it's a way to make sure that we're on track um, to, the, to the beautiful vision that folks outlined for the future. So that is an overview of the strategic plan. Um, like I said, would love to get folks feedback um, and, and maybe even a green light to keep working on this uh, for the collaborative office to hit the ground running. I think it's really important if, um, if we do the collaborative office, if that legislation does go through, if we are further ahead um, and we actually have savings, we can put it into what we need to do. So that's, I think, a really, um, you know, I'm so glad we are here today talking about it. Um, to quote Eric Tobiasen, who was the key man behind veterans, um, you know, the Veterans Village. Uh, collaborative work will help streamline the process of housing our homeless um, community through. So anyway, thank you for that. And are there questions? No one has any questions. Well, as as one of the as one of the co-conveners of the of the emergency homeless task force, I I just wanted to give a little perspective on this strategic plan. This was one of the primary tasks of the Emergency Homeless Task Force. And um, in, in some ways, it was, uh, uh, you know, it, it was a, a very, very, very tight, compressed, fast timeline to get this, uh, get this draft completed. Uh, and in some ways, it was very, uh, it was also very slow. I mean, there was a lot of people who wanted to see this, wanted to see, uh, see a complete la draft uh, yesterday and two yesterdays ago and and you know uh, months ago um, so um, I, I just wanted to um, you know and I, I, I hope I can speak for for Megan as well on this but um, just express tremendous gratitude and thanks to all of the the service providers who made up the um, 
you know, the, 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 you know the, the, the muscle, really, I would say, of the Emergency Homeless Task Force to uh, frame the, these problems for us, generate these ideas that are now captured in this document. Um, I, I would also say that, uh, you know, I still do see it as a draft. And so um, there, there have been a number of questions about, you know, well, is this done? And, you know, what do you do with it now? Um, and if we uh, move forward with the, the collaborative response office uh, legislative concept, um, we could, we have actually the, the option of taking this, this draft and, you know, polishing it a little bit more and, and, and saying we're done and then moving forward with, the, with implementation of, of some of the important things in this, in this plan. Um, but I, I'd also say to people who are concerned about, um, you know, about, uh, you know, how quickly this was developed, how, um, you know, whether they haven't had a chance to look at it in, in depth yet or not, uh, that we also have, you know, if we proceed with the collaborative office, uh, response office uh, concept, we also have the option of making this a, you know, okay, this is a rough draft. And we can we can go back and work it a, a lot more as needed um, to get it to the place we, we need to so that it can act as our deliverable for um, for that initiative and for that piece of legislation so there's there are a lot of ways that we can use um, this this what I think is is excellent work um, at this point as a as either a very complete platform for for what's next or as uh, a lot of good raw material for us to, to, to refine and continue to work on. I see Councillor yeah, Keebler's, say, yeah. th thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's hard to see behind us. And Yeah, thank you for that. And Councillor Keebler, um, I know you're having some connection issues, so you're probably on the phone. And um, yeah, if you could go ahead, please. Yeah, sorry, I can't turn my camera on. My connection's quite bad where I'm at. But um, I wanted to echo a lot of what Commissioner Chang said. And especially, I'm so pleased to see that this plan came um, from and was rooted in feedback from service providers and people who have been doing this work in our community for years and years. And um, Brittany's point about, you know, getting, because I'm also very glad to see specific milestones and measurable results and having those come from our service providers is great because they really know have a good sense what is achievable and what are the goals we should be setting um, as we go step by step in in working on this issue so um, i think i i definitely um and all, am all behind a green light to keep working on this and keep moving it forward i think we've made incredible progress with this plan as far as getting to that coordination that our service providers are asking for to help fill those gaps and start to build capacity that we need. Um, and as Commissioner Chang said, you know, I see this as a, as a working document, um, and especially with the milestones, we'll want to continue to keep checking back in. Are we on track um, to achieve our goals? Are we implementing this correctly? Does something need to change? This is not something to be set in stone, I think, but it's a really great starting place for um, our collaboration across the region. So thanks. Thank you. Oh, I, is Eric, I just have some questions. I know that Bethlehem and the county started that quite a while ago. And how many um, residents did they increase it just recently? So I'm wondering how many people can actually be at the Bethlehem Inn at this moment in time? Because I know they've increased their capacity. And then I know Shepherd's House also is in a plan currently to increase their capacity. So I'm just wondering. How, ma how many more beds have they uh, been able to offer to the community? Do you have that available? And Eric, Lynn McConnell. So we have a contract with Bethlehem Inn. Uh, we, they, they receive some funding. So I, Lynn might be able to answer that if you if you. Yeah, can. no, I'd defer to, to Lynn. Okay. Oh, okay. Sure. I just, because, you know, we're, we're saying we're so short. And I do know that some of our community has tried to already reach out. And I just wondered, well, what, what has their reach been? Sure, and I think for, for everybody, too, before I turn it over to Lynn, we have created a new dashboard, a, sh a shelter dashboard on our city council website. So we have a goal of providing housing for 500 folks that are uh, experiencing homelessness. I think right now we're at 284. I mean, you can click on that dashboard and go to exactly to Bethlehem Inn and click on Bethlehem Inn and it'll show you exactly what's available. 
So that's a, a resource. But Lynn can speak more specifically about capacity and what that's increased can I, in Shepherd's House in Bethlehem. In. Could I also just ask a clarification question? Uh, Commissioner Dare, are you asking specifically about the expansions of Bethlehem Inn and, and Shepherd's House in Redmond or no, no, broadly? No, no, just here in Bend okay. is what I was thinking because I knew they both had expanded. Um, you know, I know we've helped fund 88 beds in um, Redmond right. for that, for Bethlehem's project there. And I, to me, that was, we were so lucky because it's 88 beds. You know, it's not 30 to 60, it's 88. And so hopefully when that's um, all open, the, you know, the capacity is greater. And I know things in Bend are a lot more expensive. So, um, you know, you spent, what, $4.5 on that turnkey? So I want to, um, <clears throat> yeah, I want us to sort of, let's hear from um, Lou McConnell, Councillor Perkins. I think you had something to add. I also want us to also just look at the, the structure today and see sort of, um, and like I think we I, obviously it's good to have updates in real time, which is really important. But I also know that in front of us is a strategic plan through 2027. So I want us to sort of also see, sort of move through that, have any comments, input, and then look at next steps for this um, as well. So, um, so thank you for your questions. I just wanted to yes. know the numbers because I know yeah. you know when they say we haven't done anything. Well we have you know just but of course yes. it's not enough Lynn do you have any numbers for us yeah Commissioner Adair thanks so much for bringing that up because I think that that is kind of the first joint homeless project that this um, this group had together back in the day is how the city and county were able to purchase that old motel on behalf of the Bethlehem Inn and then help scale that thing up. I think we've we've both sort of um, interjected along the way to help keep them moving forward. So prior to their expansion, you will probably remember that they had the only five family units between the Cascades and Boise, Idaho. <laughs> they have doubled those units, thankfully. So we now have 10 family rooms in the Bethlehem Inn, and then there's a lot more work going on to build family rooms elsewhere as well. They also have gone up from, I believe, 89 beds to about 108. However, the challenge now is that not all 108 beds are actually available because of staffing challenges. So I'm so glad that in today's discussion, the staffing and the, the cost of staffing came up because that's very critical to our success as well as the actual beds themselves. Um, Shepherd's House, we are in the process and I'll probably talk about this in a moment as well. Um, we have issued a notice of intent to award the Navigation Center contract to Shepherd's House and working with them right now through that contract in process on the Second Street Shelter. The benefit of this is, although it probably won't expand the number of beds that we will have in the community, what it does lend is permanency. And that's so, so, so important, especially for highly trained case managers and staff for this population to have folks that know that they'll have a job for more than a year. <laughs> It's really important for longevity and keeping people engaged in the work and community. So we're really excited about that, um, uh, bringing some permanence to that Second Street location. Great. Thank you so much. And then, Commissioner Adair, if you're looking for more overview numbers, we also just at our last council meeting saw the, um, the kind of houselessness dashboard that the city the city staff have developed. So you can look there to see kind of the overarching numbers of, of shelters. So. Well, I, you resource. know, I just think it's important to point out that you you have ac we have actually done some things. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, and, um, I know it's um, coordination is critical, right? Mm -hmm. Collaboration, coordination. So thank you. Yeah. So thank you, and <clears throat> I'm also going to note that we actually are going to drill down, take about a 30 minutes or so to actually drill down a lot of the current projects that both Deschutes County and the City of Bend. Are working on right now as so, part of the presentation which is awesome is anybody then going to go over the action plan are, are you going to go over that right now that, that's really the intent is to get some feedback so we can kind of go by the the five uh strategies that uh, Brittany walked through and see what kind of feedback that you have there's a lot of detail in the packet that have not just the strategies but the actions as well as some of the metrics and then, of course, a vision. I think that was the feedback that we received at the uh, at a previous joint meeting about the need for a vision. So you see that right up front in the strategic plan, that vision. Yes. The action plan itself is like 21 pages, so okay. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I would, I would encourage if we want to drill down on specific parts of the action plan um, rather than wordsmithing, wordsmithing specific actions that we just kind of identify sections and say, you know, I think this section isn't quite there yet or I think this section could be phrased differently rather than um, trying to, to do wordsmithing. So, Councillor Perkins, thank you. I'll, I'll wait till so, we Okay. So, let's say you have like 15 minutes, and then we, um, it's just to go through a brief overview of the action, actual plan. Yeah, sure. So, the five um, priorities that are laid out on the plan that we just walked through on the website hold each of the, the sets of actions. So, around enlisting the community, engage the whole community. We have adopting a whole of community orientation, um, which is recognizing that partnerships need to be built. So action one is building the partnerships across business partners, education, health, philanthropy, charities, nonprofits, bringing them together to understand what we're setting out to do with the strategic plan and how they can help. Getting buy-in is gonna be really important here. So the second action under community engagement is around public education. Um, using this tool and this beautiful um, storyboard that the Zoe agency put together. Um, you know what? I have been on mute. mute. I, apologize. I apologize. I've been on, I've mute, been on mute as I've talked through the first two buckets. Too. Yeah, that's Oh, weird. oh. <laughs> You're fine. You're, You're doing great, Brittany. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. Mm. Just make sure the mic is close enough and you're all good. There we go. We good now? Okay. I'm sorry. I saw myself on mute and panicked, which was not helpful for anyone. Um, where was I? Public education, the, the tool that Zoe Agency put together, making sure that the public truly understands the economics of growth in Deschutes County and what it has meant for certain residents, some residents of the county, um, what poverty looks like. Six and a half percent of residents of Deschutes County are um, either living at or below the poverty level or not earning enough to be able to live here. Six and a half percent, that's that 13,000 number uh, from the United Way that Don cited earlier. So public education about what the realities are, that the growth has been beautiful and it has had a cost on actual human lives and we haven't been responding to that at the level needed. Um, so public education is really outlined um, in detail about how you can undertake such a campaign. Um, there's media work to be done. There is leadership of people with lived experience of homelessness in becoming a part or being positioned as leaders in this conversation. Um, you know, it's harmful to spend so much time talking about people instead of talking with people. And so um, this public education uh, set of, or this action is really focused on the resources that are needed to tell a trauma-informed story and make sure that the public is on the same page, that we're having a real conversation about houselessness um, uh, in the community. So the third action is around an advisory group. As I was saying, the leadership of people with lived experience is a proven best practice around the country um, that people who are experiencing homelessness are the ones who know what they need in order to get back on their feet. Um, too often there are too many layers between people expressing to service providers what they need, service providers not being able to offer that, um, and elected officials and uh, leaders not being able to hear all the way down to understand what do people really need? What should we really be prioritizing? So here, I, this came up in action planning in December and I thought it was a beautiful idea that the collaborative office have um, be supporting an advisory group of people experiencing homelessness to be able to support policymakers and leaders in, in navigating and, and moving the strategic plan forward. And last is the community fund that I mentioned, bringing together a public-private partnership, something that I was a bit surprised by, to be frank, um, coming into Deschutes County, is that there's not a lot of philanthropy at the table. Um, and I know that there is interest in the business community, so making sure that that's an intentionally designed public-private partnership, um, where service providers can actually get flexible funding to increase wages, to expand services as needed, not being on these, you know, shoestring, irregular budgets. Um, so that's the, that's 
the whole of community approach. Do folks have questions about this section that we want to get into at all? We actually have 21 groups in Deschutes County that give out free food. Mm -hmm. 21, I mean, so uh, I believe our community is incredibly generous. Um, you know, I, you know when you, I mean, when you'd say that, um, you know, and then I actually heard yesterday from someone who said there was like a hazmat out in the Forest Service because homeless people, that's what they're doing and that's what our community calls us about mm -hmm. and says, you know, so, you know, there's two sides to this story. Absolutely. And um, I don't want to ignore that side when there's hazmat waste out in, in the Forest Service. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, when I was speaking of philanthropy, I meant specifically foundations investing side by side with the government. Um, there's, it's in most cities that are grappling with increases of homelessness, they've had private partners set uh, stand up alongside them to fund what government can't fund. Government can often not be as flexible as it needs to be. And so um, that public-private partnership piece is just an important one to keep in mind that it's not necessarily about the volunteerism, which is beautiful um, to look across. I know in the narrative they talk about Family Kitchen has a volunteer list 400 people long. Um, and still, though, there are folks living out in the desert who actually can't make it into the places where they are serving food. That's where shared strategy comes in. That's where we can get an overall view of what is happening, where there are gaps, and where we can target resources to, to bridge those gaps. Um, any other questions around the community engagement? I do want to acknowledge someone did go to Shepherd's, um, to Shepherd's, not Shepherd's House, but Veterans Village, and wrote a check for a hundred thousand dollars. So there are there are some. I know that cost over a million dollars. I the county definitely contributed. So did the city. But there was a lot of private businesses that stepped in there too. So um, you know, I, I do believe that project is really a shining star here, and I'm hoping that we can do more projects like that. Um, I don't think it is on. Um, th this maybe I should have asked of Dawn, but here I am. Uh, uh, he, what about um, misconceptions about crime and homelessness? Um, in my understanding, there's a real myth that homeless folks are committing, um, you know, are very dangerous and are committing crimes when in fact, you know, the crimes that are committing are crimes against property. They're pretty petty thefts. Mm -hmm. Is that included in this work? In, am I right about that? Is it included in our work someplace, in the website someplace? Yeah, I don't know that. I don't think the data is in on the website, and that may be something to work with the Bend Police Department and the Sheriff's Office on. Um, but it's it certainly something that I've seen in other communities where rates of survival crime may be high, things like trespassing, um, even trespassing to use a restroom, to use a porta potty. Electricity. For example. Charge cell phones, I've learned. Exactly. Yeah. And and those are crimes. They do have a price for the person paying of that electric yes. bill. Right. But how do we acknowledge that those are survival crimes? Um, and uh, you know, working with the sheriff's office and police department, unfortunately, a simple way to get the data is how many of the folks that you're arresting have home addresses? That's right. in right. Um, folks, I, I live in Seattle and down on Third Avenue, which is a really difficult hotspot for uh, drug use and, um, and violent crime. There was a misconception that people experiencing homelessness were fueling all of that. Right. And all we had to do was ask police officers, the folks you're arresting for dealing do they have home addresses? And they do. Right. Mm. Oftentimes people experiencing homelessness are a scapegoat for other levels, layers of crime. Um, I think there's a legitimacy to fear of new neighbors yes. who are living in unstable situations, moving into a neighborhood. Um, but again, people are, are uh, by and large, if they are breaking laws, they are survival laws of crime, uh, uh, trespassing, et cetera. And so that's something that should be tackled head on of what are the fears, how are safety precautions put into place for everyone right. to ensure their safety? People who are experiencing homelessness are actually at really high risk of um, physical violence yes. and verbal abuse. 
Um, so it means it needs to be acknowledged from both sides of the coin, for sure. That was another um, that yes, that's exactly what I understand is that idea that when they are violent cr crimes that are occurring, they kind of stay within that homeless community and their crimes against each other. The folks who are experiencing homelessness are the ones who are actually at risk of safety kind of crimes mm -hmm. versus those folks going out into the community and harming people. Mm -hmm. you know? And of course, yes, property crimes do harm people. I'm, I don't mean to say that. But you know, crimes against persons, I think, is how police usually describe those actual assaults and things mm -hmm. like that. We actually so, had last year, um, Barb, 925 calls to China Hat uh -huh. in our 911, 925. Right. Um, through March of last spring, it was 325 for a whole 10 months. So clearly last year, it did increase what was going on in China Hat. Now, some of those calls, Colleen identified, or not Colleen, Sarah, identified as being duplicates, a few of them, but truly it had gone up. So, and then when I was visiting East Antler a year and a half ago, there was actually, um, Officer Zook pointed out the drug dealer of um, East Antler, and they had all the other trailers that they had absconded with from the other people who were not paying their drugs bills. But that person is still like sitting there, you know? So uh -huh. anyway, there's, there's that side of the story. Right, right, Patty. And I think that's, you know, heaven help us, honestly, try and at one, on one hand saying, we can save money here because we can save money in 911 calls, that if we can help these folks and get them into housing, we can actually reduce the number of survival crimes, is that what you describe them as? Um, while at the same time reassuring folks that you know these crimes that are occurring now, the savings that we can occur is not in assaults. It's not you know homeless people going out into the community and committing assaults or you know heaven forbid murders or something. They're going out into the community. They're stealing gasoline. They're stealing electricity. They're stealing um, recyclables. That's happened in my own neighborhood. Um, you know just to be able to turn. The, and again, survival crimes. You know these are things people are doing just to be able to try and survive. So, so that, that, yes, Patty, you know, this is a complicated thing we are trying to help people understand. So, so that the need for, uh, so the need for uh, clear information that right. Councilor Campbell is, is identifying is the reason why strategic priority number one is engage the whole community and the, the second item on that list is about, is about getting good information out right. and uh, maybe uh, you know, as if we're thinking of this as a as a living document, maybe we we actually insert a something between one and eleven that specifically focuses on um, helping people understand the you know uh, what crime means mm -hmm. uh, in, in the homeless in in, in the, the, the 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 community of people experiencing homelessness or um, yeah. You know, both all of those things that that you know, there's what what crimes are people actually committing? What crimes are being committed against them? You know, what what kind of impacts does that have on our public safety system? Um, all of those things would be that 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 seems like a great piece of the public information package. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> so thanks for the question, Barb. And I think um, Councillor Schenkelberg has something to add. Thanks, Barb. Um, it's almost like not having housing isn't a crime. Yeah. <laughs> almost like people not having structures and food is not, like, I understand why we're kind of getting in the weeds and splitting hairs a little bit on how we have this conversation with the public. And, like, people not having homes is not someone, they don't need to go to prison because they don't have a home. It's like it's this huge fall of the systemic issue that's been perpetuated for hundreds of years. And so I think that when we're having these conversations, of course, like survival and like people need these things and all of that is true. And like they are not they are not criminals. Right. They are not people who are, you know, going to be stuck in the they shouldn't I don't know how to actually say that statement, but it's not illegal. 
if not illegal. And I think that when we have these conversations, sometimes it can end up perpetuating this thought that it is, mm -hmm. and it is not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. No, if that's an excellent point. Yeah. Being homeless is not a crime. Being homeless does not make you a criminal. And some of these folks are being forced into a position of committing occasionally some property crimes yeah. just to try and survive. So Brittany, I'm going to turn this back to you. We have about 20 minutes left to summarize our projects and then we have sort of an up 10 minutes left for a wrap up. Um, let's take a pause here for a second. We have um, a really strong, um, deeply informed strategic plan in front of us. Um, we've heard a lot of comments and questions and some input. There's a lot of detail on this plan. What do you need from us today and is there a setup then what have you envisioned in terms of ways to continue this conversation? Um, is there anything and maybe you want to do this sort of in the wrap up but there is there anything that you staff and people who've worked on this plan need specifically right now from this group while we're all sitting together? Well, I think at the staff level, certainly, we're interested to know, is this the, the framework that we're going to proceed with? I, we heard a lot of great uh, discussion at the start. Of, we've just seen it. M many of us have just seen it for the first time in the last 48 to 72 hours. Um, I think Commissioner Chang mentioned there's a lot of really good raw material, but of course it's beyond, it's, it's really organized very well under the strategic plan. So I think the real key is, as we look at all uh, our elected officials, is this a foundation that we can begin to work with going forward? And of course we know the next steps then will be, which we'll talk about here shortly, will be the legislative session and then likely meeting again uh, in, in March uh, to begin creating a joint management agreement and things of that nature. But really, this is the foundational document of, of where we're at and it, it recognizing it's a draft. So that's what, at the staff level, will be most helpful for us to know from you. Yes. <laughs> Kelsey, yes. And I, I, I just wanted to, I mean, following on what Nick said, I just want to, uh, uh, you know, mention again, uh, the meat of this strategic plan, all of these action items came out of a flurry of action planning work group, sub work group you know, um, meetings over a, a week. And I, I believe that uh, everyone was, you know, it was open and everyone was invited to participate in those. But it was, it was, um, happened very quickly. It was very, um, yeah, it, you know, it came up very quickly, so like not a whole lot of notice, and, and it was a really compressed timeline for all of those meetings. So, like, I don't want to presume that that all of the uh, commissioners and counselors had a chance to provide all of the input that they wanted to provide during that that week. So, uh, I, I, you know, I would couch I would couch my support for um, you know for this strategic plan in that way. I I think that there is a, a tremendous amount of um, valuable insight and perspective and vision uh, from a whole slew of uh, uh, amazing service providers in our community in here. Um, but if there are um, electeds who are not, you know, haven't fully internalized this yet and absorbed it, then, you know, that, that is a, a reasonable thing to feel at, the, at this time. But uh, it would be really helpful to just get an understanding of, you know, if there are if there are sections, you know, you know, um, there's five strategic priority areas. If there's one of those that's, you know, a, a real concern, it'd be it'd be great to kind of home in and know that that's a concern um, for for future work. So I think maybe the question is, are we as a group generally supportive? of the overall structure that we're seeing here, knowing that there's still a lot of detail work to go forward. So maybe if we could go around and start with you, Chair Adair, and just, you know, are you generally, right, without sort of dropping down into all the details, which we know we still probably deserve to go through since this is a fresh document, are you right. generally supportive of this? Yes, generally supportive. Um, you know, it is 21 pages, and there's a lot of detail there. And, um, I would like to have a little more 
time to actually follow through with some things. But yes, generally, yes. definitely supportive. I do feel that um, having, you know, our joint office um, really get to the root of the problem, as I call it, truly to the root, not just moving people from one side to the other. And, um, you know, you think about it, and I think it's important. So it's, it's, there's definitely a need, and, but yet I want to respect the people that are on the other side that are saying, please, um, please be very careful where you locate things. Mm -hmm. um, Councilor Goodman-Campbell? Yes, I'm supportive. Thank you. Uh, a couple thoughts. Bond. Yeah, really good uh, discussion today. So uh, one of the things I see here is you know, there's a, it, it takes a long time to get to this spot, and it's going to take time to get out of it. Uh, we don't want it to get worse. We want it to get better, referring to people that have opportunities for housing. Uh, you know, there's a, one of the concepts could be uh, economic refugee, referring to somebody that's worked, uh, you know, for many years, and now they're in this bad spot. You know, think about that. You know, people have probably, t some people have taken, you know, time and energy to have a career, uh, you know, uh, variable housing opportunities over the years. And now, uh, you know, it's, there's just not a, a, a place to land later in life. So, I mean, uh, there's just all these scenarios out there is what I'm referring to. Uh, when I think of small business, uh, you know, that's, you know, the scenario of, of somebody losing their job because they found out they were homeless. I mean, that doesn't even register in my head not that it didn't happen but it seems like any employer is going to want to help support that person so let's uh, reach out and welcome anybody that's employed in small business if a small business owner uh, has somebody that's struggling I mean that's the opportunity to rally around and help stabilize that person so I mean, you know as I say it's hard for me to even digest that scenario that was presented you know maybe it happened but man that's not the future that can't be what we're doing one of the things I think of that is a really tricky scenario here that I don't know what we're talking about. What's, a, what's the right function of density for cities in the state of Oregon? And I'm referring to our state land use system. Uh, you know, we have X amount of people that are homeless, looking transitional housing. We have people living in the forested lands. Uh, uh, the responsibility of a city is to try to reduce the impacts. But uh, so, I, you know, I'm just thinking, what is a metric? It'd be interesting to maybe think about a metric, you know, uh, the density of people per, you know, square mile or city block or, you know, whatever, uh, you know, the second street redevelopment, you know, what kind of density is there? And, you know, these, we've got community development people know these numbers, but there may be different ways to look at uh, a document like this. Uh, so, as I say, uh, you know, it's being acknowledged as a draft today. Uh, it's a strategic plan that's been just put out. Uh, I'm still digesting what, you know, some of this. Some of the words in the mindset maybe going into this is different for, for different people. So, I mean, it's a starting point. I, you know, I don't know what else to say. So sounds like you're generally supportive and there's work to be done. We are in this together and we're going to have to do something positive in the future, no matter what. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I support all these priorities. I think this is a great start, um, particularly focused on the, the sub priorities of making sure that we're, everything we're doing is based on data and facts and reality and um, I think that this is the very start of that. I think that the collaborative office is the linchpin to this entire effort and I'm excited for the future. Um, support and appreciate Commissioner Chang and Councillor Perkins for helping get us to this spot. Thank you. Councillor Chang. Uh, also supportive and thank you Brittany for your equitable work on being on the ground and understanding the policy background thank you Commissioner Chang uh, I'm, I'm supportive I, I think maybe one other we might have the, the opportunity to ask one other question to kind of parse this out a little bit which would be um, there's five strategic priorities listed here is there is there a strategic priority that's missing um, and if amongst us we believe there is one then that I, I think that would indicate you know where uh you know future future kind of like the, the first tier future work needs to happen you know, kind of fleshing out a whole additional priority as a as opposed to the the refinement of the the actions that we've already got which 
it also needs to happen, but which is, you know, I'd, I'd much rather know now that there's a whole priority missing than, uh, than later. Thank you. Good question. Noted. Generally supportive. Yes. Yes. Council Perkins? Um, you know, I believe in listening to experts, and the first thing that Don said um, about the visual narrative is that we, the public, need to know what they know, and this task force and the strategic plan came out of pe a lot of people who really know um, and are really in it, so I enthusiastically support it. Thank you. And I, as well, join you. Um, this is, I can't believe how much has been put together um, and I'm really proud of our community for actually working together just to bring this strategic plan forward with these incredibly informative um, presentations today. I think we have so much to learn as a community and as community leaders as well and understand and we recognize how important it is to move forward and capture the opportunities that are ca coming at us. Um, and just wanted to take, <clears throat> excuse me, a moment to recognize um, our local representatives and senators who are supporting House Bill 4123. Um, and that can really help us move forward and fund a collaborative office and recognize the cities in Deschutes County who have stepped forward to also recognize the importance of this as well. So all this work really comes together. And um, Councilor Keebler. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, fully supportive and, and really excited, like other people um, have already mentioned, that we've gotten to this point and gotten this type of a plan put together. I think this is something that's really been missing from the landscape of our response to homelessness in our region. So I'm just, I'm, I'm just really pleased that the county's joining us in prioritizing this and making a really smart policy. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work on it. Thank you. So we're almost on time, aren't we? We're almost on time, so projects. Yeah, we will be quick, and I'm gonna just hand out a piece of paper that summarizes projects and ask Lynn McConnell, our housing director, thank you, um, to, to walk through this just in about five minutes or so. Some of this is just a repeat. We wanna, again, thank the county commission for your approval of the 1.5 million of ARPA funds that we solidified a few weeks ago that's helping to advance these projects. Um, you know, and I think this is also a, an example of oh, the type indeed. of this work a collaborative <laughs> office would be doing. We've got a head start. We've got a plan. We've got things that are in the works. So I know that all of us are not just sitting on our hands waiting for all this to come together. We're just actively working on many different fronts. Um, so, uh, Lynn, if you could just walk us through. Carolyn cannot be here today because, and I just want to point this out, Carolyn is working on a contract with mm -hmm. Neighbor Impact mm -hmm. to open up the Ben Value in our project turnkey that's going to go to council on uh, Wednesday. So we're working with Neighbor Impact. And so that was a priority uh, to get her to, to work on that contract to get that shelter open. Um, so Lynn uh, is uh, filling in. Go ahead, Lynn. Hi, everyone. Lynn McConnell, Housing Director for the City of Bend. I'll give you a brief overview and then I can go into a little more detail if folks have um, additional interest. So um, as you all know, with outdoor shelters, we have about 20 to 30 sites in development, really reviewing what the feasibility is. We thank you for your partnership in, in our ongoing discussions with that. Um, we also have St. Vincent de Paul with a 10 unit micro village shelter under construction. As you all know, Veterans Village has 10 units open with five more on the way. And um, we thank your staff for working with us on all of the agreements and um, various different uh, parameters with that project. It's been so fun to see that come to light. Um, Division Street Shelter Project Turnkey, Eric just gave you the summary on that, um, working on renovations and sort of what the overall structure is with renovations in our two existing properties and ensuring that folks have a place to be as we continue, um, continue to turn all of these sites into something that works better for our community. Um, Second Street, as I mentioned earlier today, that will be our navigation center, and we are working through the details of that. Um, so again, there's some renovations that will be needed for that property to really function effectively. So that this group knows a navigation center is a low barrier shelter with access to various different services and programs to help people get stable um, and back on their feet. And so that's really how we're looking at this is the permanency of that low barrier shelter um, and also a more robust service provision to support these folks who are residing there. 
Um, the safe parking program has been really a tremendous success in a very limited capacity because of the lack of sites. Um, and so again, inviting the community to provide um, us locations that we may be able to use for safe parking or that our partners can use for safe parking. Um, right now, uh, 12 spots available in that, and there's been really success, a lot of success with transitioning folks into permanent housing or stable housing from that program. Um, so um, the notes that I am looking at um, still sort of indicated there might be an announcement soon, and you all have heard that. That is that the city is negotiating for the purchase of the Rainbow Motel um, on Franklin Avenue. And, and again, that sort of adds to what I'm calling our ecosystem to support our residents. Um, so as we continue to develop out each of the three structures that we, we hope to own, um, ensuring that folks have a place to stay overnight, um, people who are residing in any of those locations right now, um, and, and ensuring that that service provision is carried on throughout our renovations and, and moving moving things around with, with the three sites. Um, let's see. I believe that that is it for my update. Eric, am I forgetting anything or is there anything else you wanted me to touch on? The item I mentioned is that we are, all, are also updating our right-of-way policy. We did update our right-of-way policy and then we are going to be working in, in partnership with the county as well on, on Camping regulations, you know, it's you know this sort of working on supplies we've just been talking about, but also making sure that we're managing our public lands and our right of way appropriately. So that's a project that's just kicking off. And um, I also would think maybe you'd want to add that there is a capital campaign for um, Shepherd's House. I know they want to double the number of women and children up to 20, and then they're also working, I believe, on their main house. I was talking to Dave and Natori the other day, but I know it's not actually city ban, but it's, it's here within your city limits. So I think that's important that they're trying to do more um, in their private partnerships. Definitely. Um, in addition, you, the City Council has not yet had the opportunity to decide on the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee's recommendations for affordable housing uh, funding, but that will happen in the second February meeting at Council, um, and there's going to be potentially some alignment with what the county has done as well. So very excited to see that come forward um, and uh, welcome you to tune in for a little more discussion on some of those more permanent solutions as well. So, who's going to do Deschutes County? I am. Over here. Okay. <laughs> I'm hiding behind the coffee. Yes, um, the coffee. <laughs> Good morning still. I'm Eric Krupp, Deputy County Administrator. I would like to highlight a couple of Deschutes County projects. There's a lot more, but um, I'm just going to focus on a few. And really, the uh, thank you, Mayor. The common theme is, is partnerships, and, and none of these would have happened without the partnerships. And really, the partnership one of the main partnerships was the Bethlehem Inn between the city and the county when we purchased uh, the old Econo Lodge in 2007 and now look today what we, what we have with that whole site redeveloped. Uh, first project I'm not going to spend too much time on because uh, people in this room are very familiar with Veterans Village. It is a great partnership between the city of Bend, Deschutes County, Central Oregon Veterans Outreach, Bend Heroes Foundation, and Hayden Homes. Uh, this project is one southeast of the city of Redmond, obviously not in the city of Bend, but as we recognize, homelessness is a regional problem. So anything we do in other communities will also assist in, um, efforts in the city of Bend. Oasis Village is looking at taking two acres of 10 acres and developing uh, tiny homes. Last month, the uh, Board of County Commissioners approved $32,000 in ARPA funds so that Oasis Village could contract with Rogue Retreat. Rogue Re Retreat is the project outside of, outside of um, Medford. And uh, Rogue Retreat has an uh, arm of their organization that help communities replicate what they're doing uh, outside of, of uh, Medford. Also, earlier this week, the Board of County Commissioners approved $367,000 towards the project for uh, capital expenses, which includes uh, 10 shelter units, shower, restroom, dining, kitchen, and laundry facility. The next steps will be to work with Rogue Retreat and Oasis Village, and also look at master planning the full 10 acres. Oasis Village will take up approximately 
two of the 10 acres. So there's um, staff will work with the Board of County Commissioners, o Oasis Village, and the community to master plan the other eight acres. And there's all kinds of different ideas and possibilities uh, for the eight acres. And where is that, Eric? I'm sorry. Sure. It's, it's southeast of uh, the city of Redmond on, on county land, just off of Highway, I think it's 126. And it's surrounded by county land. That's the really good thing. So we could yell at ourselves. <laughs> And then the last area I wanted to highlight is the wraparound services. We've heard many references this morning about the importance of services. Not only do we need to provide people with shelter, affordable housing, homes, a, a roof over their head, um, but the wraparound services are critical. And Deschutes County with the homeless outreach team provides some of those wraparound services. The Board of County Commissioners recently um, designated some ARPA dollars to expand the homeless outreach team. And it's really important to talk a little bit about what that team does. Many people in the community have a misconception about the role of that team. The Deschutes County Health Services Homeless Outreach Team focuses on homeless individuals with a mental illness. And for, for those individuals, they provide mental health and substance abuse treatment case management and basic needs support, psychiatry and medication, and also the work to get those people into a housing situation. And then the last item is the health services crisis services, which includes a stabilization center that the city of uh, Bend City Councilors are well aware of, as well as the Board of County Commissioners. The picture on the slide is actually at the inside of the building where, where people have some, some uh, respite care. And then the last one is the MCAT, Mobile Crisis, crisis and Assessment Team, for people in the community experiencing a mental health crisis rather than always having police respond. Uh, our community has another option, and MCAT responds 24-7 to those situations. And that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, and just to remind you, we are looking for help and funding for the Stabilization Center to keep it open 24-7. I believe a significant portion of the people that have been visited are from the city of Bend. So we have a complete breakdown of where all those people are coming from. And, um, you know, your, your city's help would be appreciated. And just as a, a note to that, we are going to follow up. And myself, the police chief, uh, Nick, Holly Harris are meeting, I believe it's next week or the week after. Uh, to start uh, putting some plans together and we'll be um, providing some options for our council for consideration for partnership there. Great, thank you so much because the uh, major funding that allowed us to open it 24 seven, that doesn't really happen. We won't know that answer until July. So it is critical. So and, thank you. And we're trying to move towards a more stable local funding base, including foundational funding from the from the county general fund, uh, as opposed to being so heavily grant dependent. Commissioner DeBone? And that's where we are truly, we, the, the community, but these services are taking uh, unstable individuals, putting wraparound services, peer supports, medical uh, support, and stabilizing and housing people. And so, so these are some of the, the, you know, the most challenging situations of homeless also. I mean, they're truly, not a lot, but uh, one at a time, people are being, uh, you know, supported is uh, enough to get them into stable housing. So this is where that happens. I yes. just want to mention, and we're not talking about what the county's doing with affordable housing, which is one of the outcomes, of course, of all the work we're doing. With the $7.8 in ARPA funding that the Board of Commissioners has allocated, a lot of land donations for, to Habitat for Humanity. Um, in Lapine, there's an RFP out for services for the Simpson Avenue property right now. Um, so the county's doing a lot when it comes to uh, affordable housing as well that we're not covering. We're just really focusing on the houselessness issue uh, at this point. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, um, Nick, for pointing that out. I think it's really significant. Our habitat, uh, core, uh, and then the land that we gave all, all across the county. Truly, um, I do believe it will be helpful. It's so much better if you can actually have a mortgage. Um, it's, you know, it's better for your family. Any other comments? 
Well, one of the keys, uh, thank you, Mayor, is we do have a letter of support. I haven't yet shared it with the Board of Commissioners. I just received it, I think it was yesterday. I'll uh, present it to the Board on Monday under other items. But it's a letter of support for House Bill 4123 um, with all of the cities that have signed on or will sign on in the region with all of our logos. Uh, I'll send that to you today and we can discuss it under other items. But it, it really communicates our collective support uh, for House Bill 4123, especially with hearings scheduled in very short order. I would just add uh, to Nick, so I think we're kind of on to the next steps or uh, the final item and just to wrap things up. Uh, as Nick and I have talked about, I think we want to track that legislation fairly closely and uh, we should know the outcome of that by the end of February, early March, and we see anticipate another joint meeting in March once we know the outcome and then if, if we are successful to begin outlining and continue to take some feedback on the strategic plan as mentioned today, I think this is just the beginning. So as we, um, as you digest it and have information to share and feedback to give that, you know, that can be done through our individual bodies and then maybe bring us back together in March to share any additional feedback and the outcome of the legislative efforts and then potentially moving forward towards an intergovernmental agreement or joint management agreement, whatever the mechanism is to keep us going. Great. So in March, as soon as we know, and it does have bipartisan support all over the state because there are, fortunately, they expanded from five to eight different um, counties. So it truly has, um, I think, you know, it looks like it should have a, you know, opportunity to pass. And that was it from staff in terms of uh, right. wrap up. Mayor Russell, anything um, else? Are we ready to wrap up? We want to just go around the table quickly with for final comments we've had a lot to talk we've had a lot of opportunities to chat um, um, so I'm not saying I'm saying no <laughs> we can actually end on time um, so I'm just going to take a moment to really thank all the community members who have contributed in all many, many different ways to taking care of our greater community, contributing specifically to all the content in this report, um, and to the openness that I experienced in this room today in working with all of you, my colleagues, our colleagues, um, and our commitment to really moving forward um, together. It's I. I personally feel like this is the only way we're going to move forward, and I'm certainly happy to see support at the state level as well. Um, and we'll have a lot of other colleagues to work with and also learn from each other as we move forward throughout the state and definitely in Deschutes County. So I'm very happy to see this moment in time and for all the people who need us to do more sooner rather than later. Yes, sooner rather than later. You know how government is. It always seems to take a lot of time. So I do believe that this group is going to help put um, our success um, ahead. And I'm really happy that we were we met today. It's not even February yet, so we've met today. Um, please read the document if you have any input. Um, share it. And, you know, we can talk about it. So when we get together in March, we will successfully be able to go on. Yes. Right. Thank you, Chair Adair. Thank, thank you, you, Mayor Russell. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Fellow counselors. Yes. And staff.